Hi, in this video I'll be talking about ThorSwap, how it works, and dispel any misconceptions about yield farming on this platform. So if you're like me, I was looking for a place to earn on my Bitcoin natively so that I didn't have to wrap or, or peg it. So I thought this was very attractive and also looked like it gave an 18% APY. Based on this information that's displayed here, it looks like I can deposit Bitcoin and get back 18% at the end of the year. So if I deposit 100 Bitcoin, I can get back 18. Um, I understand that like all other DeFi platforms, this APY or APR is variable. So it depends on you know market conditions and supply and demand and all that. But if you are thinking that's how that works here, as I was initially, then we'd be wrong because that's not exactly how it works. I will explain all of that in this video using examples and running through the ThorSwap UI. So let's go through what ThorSwap actually is first. ThorSwap is a platform that allows users to easily swap across multiple blockchains without wrapping or pegging the assets and without a centralized counterparty. So what that means is users don't need something like Coinbase or Gemini to do the swapping. Instead, this is all decentralized and I could swap Bitcoin to Ethereum natively just by using ThorSwap. I can swap from Ethereum to Bitcoin natively. Uh, nothing needs to be wrapped or pegged. And so how the swapping happens is actually through liquidity pools. And this is no different from any traditional liquidity pools on DeFi. Um, it's just this, how it's displayed here, this information is a bit misleading, I think. And so how the liquidity pools work is that these single assets here are always paired with the Rune token, which is the native coin of the ThorSwap platform. So to add liquidity, we can go to the deposit page and it gives us a few options. So if I wanted to deposit Bitcoin only, I could do that. If I wanted to deposit Rune only, I could also do that. And if I do any of these single asset deposits, the ThorSwap community calls this an asymmetric deposit. I can also deposit Bitcoin and Ruin, and this is the traditional 50-50 ratio of Bitcoin and Ruin, and this is called a symmetric deposit. If I deposit Bitcoin into the pool, only Bitcoin as a asymmetric deposit, the protocol automatically converts half of that into Ruin tokens, and then that pair then gets put into the liquidity pool. Similarly, if I deposit Ruin tokens only, then half of that will be swapped to Bitcoin and then the pair will be put into the liquidity pool. And so since I'm providing liquidity in this case, um, all the effects of impermanent loss are in play and there's always that risk. However, what ThorSwap actually provides is what ca they're calling impermanent loss protection. And that is protecting against impermanent loss at 1% for every day that I provide liquidity. So for example, if I deposited the tokens into the pool on the first day i get one percent protection of impermanent loss after 49 days i get provided 49 percent of the impermanent loss protection and then at 100 days i get protected for all of the impermanent loss so this incentivizes me to stay in the pool longer so in permanent loss protection is paid out only when i withdraw and it only gets paid out if the impermanent loss is greater than the revenue from earned from providing liquidity. So that's the revenue from fees and incentives. And the impermanent loss protection will only subsidize the difference between the revenue from the fees and the impermanent loss. So it's not completely a risk-free investment, but this allows it to be a little bit less risky. And so if you're thinking like I was, I can deposit 100 Bitcoin and always receive back at least 100 Bitcoin. That's not actually true. With this impermanent loss protection, I can still get back less Bitcoin than I deposited. And I will go through a couple of examples on how those dynamics work within the liquidity pools. One thing to note is that when I add liquidity asymmetrically, so for example, only depositing Bitcoin into the pool or only, only depositing Ethereum. If I deposit asymmetrically, I can only withdraw asymmetrically. So if I deposit Bitcoin asymmetrically, then I can only withdraw within Bitcoin. I can't withdraw in Bitcoin and Ruin. Okay, so now that's out of the way. Let's go through some examples. Okay, so for the first example, I'll go through. It's this scenario in which I deposit into a liquidity pool and the Rune tokens price doesn't change for the duration that I'm in the liquidity pool, but Bitcoin um, increases 50%. Also, I make these assumptions here that the APY is constant at 17%. 
the total pool's liquidity is 51 million and that's constant and then my share of the liquidity pool is also constant in reality the, these things are always changing and they're changing by the minute but i'm making these assumptions just to make the uh the example a little bit easier to explain so let's assume I deposit 10 Bitcoin into the pool, which is an asymmetric deposit. And also let's assume that one Bitcoin is equal to $40,000 and one Ruin token is equal to $5. So here I'm depositing my 10 Bitcoin and the protocol splits it into Ruin tokens and Bitcoin, where half of it is Bitcoin and the rest of it is Ruin. Um, in this case, it converts to 40,000 Ruin. Then it gets deposited into the liquidity pool and I show here how much Bitcoin there is relative to Ruin tokens. And this is not drawn to scale. I just wanted to show that there are much less Bitcoin in the pool than there are Ruin tokens because of the price difference. And as you know, the values of the two tokens in total must be a 50-50 ratio. Okay, so then I withdraw after 30 days. And now Bitcoin has risen to $60,000, which is 50% of 40,000. And let's assume Rune has stayed the same price. This resulted in a permanent loss of about $10,000. And I've shown that the uh, due to arbitrage in the pool, the Bitcoin has reduced in amount um, and the Rune has increased. This is because the 50-50 ratio needs to be maintained for the pool. And since Bitcoin's price increased, the amount of Bitcoin must decrease. And so when I withdraw, I withdraw both Bitcoin and Ruin. And as a result of the change in the prices, I get back about four Bitcoin, whereas I put in five. And then I get back about 49,000 Ruin, in which I put in 40,000. So I got back more Ruin than I deposited, and I got back less Bitcoin than I deposited. And since this is an asymmetric deposit, the withdrawal is only in Bitcoin. So this the Ruins get converted to Bitcoin. And I have a total of 8.165 Bitcoin which is down from the 10 Bitcoin that I initially deposited. But this is not the entire story. I don't leave with 8.165 Bitcoin. I also get trading fees and rewards for providing liquidity. I owned about 78% of the pool um, due to my deposit amount. Using the APY and the total liquidity in the pool, I can calculate the total annual rewards and fees and incentives and then extrapolate that to how much I get, which would be 7 to 8% of that. And then also how much I would get because I only provided liquidity for 30 days um, instead of one year. That math gets calculated out to $5,666 worth of Bitcoin and Rune from trading fees and incentives. So that gets converted to Bitcoin and also gets added to my withdrawal total, which now is 9.3 Bitcoin. But that's not the end of it either. Uh, impermanent loss protection kicks in because trading fees and incentives were less than impermanent loss. So if you remember, impermanent loss was about $10,000 and the trading fees that I got was not even $6,000. So the impermanent loss protection here is 30% because I provided liquidity for 30 days. So 1% for each day I was in the pool. And that gets applied to the trading fees to impermanent loss difference not to the total and permanent loss. So that calculation comes out to $1,354 worth of impermanent loss protection. That gets converted to Bitcoin as well. And so now my total is 9.32 Bitcoin, which is still down from 10 Bitcoin, which is what I initially put in. All right, so to summarize everything in this scenario in which Rune stayed the same and Bitcoin increased 50% during that time, my return on Bitcoin was actually negative 6.79% despite the 17% APY. So don't be fooled by the 17% APY. Um, you can still lose on your Bitcoin if the price action in the liquidity pool and the price ratios change as such. So just to summarize here, to compare with hodling, if I provide liquidity in the farm, my Bitcoin return on investment is minus 6.79% compared to holding just Bitcoin, which would be zero because I have the same amount of Bitcoin as I started. The Bitcoin gain and loss would be negative, about negative 0.7 Bitcoin because I started with 10 and got back about 9.32. This should be 9.32. Compare that with holding, just zero because it's zero change in Bitcoin. Now the USD return on investment is almost 40% 
whereas compared with holding is 50%. So it's even worse than just holding Bitcoin. And then the total dollar amount gain loss is about $160,000 for farming compared to $200,000 for just holding. So in this scenario, I was better off just holding Bitcoin and not participating in the farm. Even with this advertised 17% APY and with the impermanent loss protection. Now let's take a look at another example in which the Rune token price increases 50% while Bitcoin doesn't change. All the other assumptions are the same, a constant APY, pool liquidity, and my share. And I'll deposit the same amount of Bitcoin at the same prices in the beginning. Now after 30 days, uh, the Rune token has increased to $7.50 and Bitcoin has stayed the same as a month ago. And I tried to depict this in the, the amount um, of Bitcoin and Rune in the liquidity pool. Uh, I just wanted to show their, the amount of Bitcoin increased and the amount of Rune decreased. But because of their price differences, there's still less Bitcoin than there is Rune. So then when I withdraw, I get both Bitcoin and Rune back. Um, and due to the price changes, I get 6.124 Bitcoin back, whereas I deposited five. And then I get back about 33,000 ruin, less than what I initially deposited. So converting that to Bitcoin, I get 12.25 Bitcoin back. That's not accounting for trading fees. So once I account for trading fees and rewards that are accrued from providing liquidity to the pool, it's the same amount because the... APY hasn't changed and the pool liquidity hasn't changed from the last example. So I get back $5,666 worth of Bitcoin and ruin from trading fees and incentives. So that bumps up my withdrawal of Bitcoin up to 13.95 Bitcoin. And finally, there's impermanent loss protection. So the impermanent loss, it was the same as before at about $10,000. And so running through the numbers of 30%, and differencing it from the revenue from the trading fees, I get $1,354 worth of impermanent loss protection in Bitcoin, which bumps my total up to 13.98 Bitcoin. So just to summarize for this scenario, where Ruin increased 50% and Bitcoin stayed the same, my return on Bitcoin was actually almost 40%, despite only having a 17% APY. And to compare the farming yield with just holding the Bitcoin token. My Bitcoin return on investment was almost 40%. So I started with 10 Bitcoin and got back almost 14. And so the absolute gain loss in Bitcoin was almost four Bitcoin compared to holding, which is zero. Everything here is just zero. Since I'm just holding Bitcoin and Bitcoin didn't change in price, everything is zero. For the USD return on investment, it's about 40%. And then the USD gain loss was actually positive $160,000. So in this scenario, if I actually wanted to get more Bitcoin from yield farming in the liquidity pool, I would actually want the Rune token to increase relative to Bitcoin. Therefore, I can get back more Bitcoin and, and make the yield that way. So just a few more comments on the examples. I want to drive the point across that impermanent loss protection only covers impermanent loss and does not cover the decreases in Bitcoin or any underlying asset. This means I can still get back less Bitcoin than I put in. Also in the previous examples, no transaction withdrawal or slippage fees were accounted for. Actual profits will decrease and losses will increase with these fees accounted for. And the previous examples, they were both asymmetric deposits. So the um, dynamics for symmetric deposits will be pretty similar since it's the same yield farming automated market maker model. So the things that affect APY, which is actually calculated from the trading fees and incentives um, and all the things that I assumed were constant in the examples. Pool liquidity, as liquidity decreases, the APY increases. As trading volume in that pool increases, then the APY also increases. And then if the ruin price increases, uh, potentially this increases the APY. So why I say potentially is because I couldn't actually find anywhere in the docs or anywhere online that says the APY includes um, minted ruin tokens. So um, this may or may not be included in the APY. So for the calculations in the examples, I use this spreadsheet that I made um, and I'll add them in the description below. 
Just note that these are not perfect and they're solely for educational purposes. So there may be some errors, but uh, it's I think it's good to play around with these numbers to see how returns will be affected through liquidity farming on ThorSwap. I hope this helped you understand ThorSwap a little bit more and dispelled any misconceptions that you may have from just looking at the, the numbers on the platform. Yeah, so let me know if that helped. Leave it in the comments below what you think. Uh, if you like this video, go ahead and hit the thumbs up and subscribe. And as always, stay safe, stay safe, and thanks for watching.